So this is a picture of this with Kelly, and we're come to why the picture was, was uh, drawn from her. So, um, she's a local girl. So Elizabeth Kelly was born uh, in uh, September 1734 in the city of London. She was the eldest of five surviving children of William Kelly and his wife Elizabeth. Uh, the family occupied two rooms in Old Manbury Poston. Old Manbury was just outside here, it's the road we're in now. And the Poston was where you go up to the London Wall, cross over London Wall, it was a little alleyway around between there and Fall Street. So she was she grew up literally outside that front door. Um, she had very limited education. She probably could uh, was taught to read and write. Uh, but from the age of 15 or 16, she lived outside the family as a maid servant uh, in the household of a neighboring publican. And then uh, from October 1752, in the house of Edward Lyon, a carpenter and all the memories, so in the street where you today. Uh, she was considered by her employers uh, and neighbors to be hardworking and a good character. And she's described as a plump. 18-year-old, about five foot tall, with a face fitted by a smallpox, a long straight nose, and a white and wide set eyes. So you can see there's there's another version of the picture of her, which again we will come back to uh, in a moment. So why why is she so famous uh, in the 18th century? You will tell something of her story. Um, just to point out, um, we're in Aldermanbury, which is just here. So across London Wall, this is Aldermanbury Boston. Um, so this is the area she grew up in around here. So on the 1st of January, a day off for lots of people in the 18th century, uh, 1753, with no work that day, Elizabeth spent time with her family and made plans to go shopping with her mother after visiting her aunt and uncle, Alison Thomas uh, Colley, at Salt Peter Bank near Rosemary Lane. Now Salt Peter Bank is there. It's that right there. Rosemary Lane runs into a little tower on the Tower of London, uh, East Smithfield. So it's the road that runs in here. So she'd gone to visit her aunt and uncle. Um, uh, she changed her mind what she was going to do. Instead of remaining with them for the evening, about 9 a.m., accompanied by her aunt and uncle, uh, for about two thirds of her journey, she left to return to her lodging in Morgan Mabry. So not to her, her mother's house, but to where she was lodging with her, her employer. Um, but she failed to return um, to her lodgings at Edward Lyons' house. Uh, and he twice went looking for her. He went to her, her mother's home. And Mrs. Canning sent her children to Moorfields. Uh, so she's living just down here. She sent her children to look around here. That might be slightly suspicious if you see, we hear the story later on. Why did she send her, uh, her children to look around Moorfields? We're not absolutely sure. Um, uh, nobody could find her, basically. They went to the aunt and uncle, could not find her. The next morning, Mrs. Canning uh, uh, travelled to the colleague's house, the aunt and uncle's house, to uh, see if we could find more information, but she, this was still missing. And for weeks after that, she looked for her, all over. She employed her neighbours to people, she didn't advertise it in the newspapers, um, saying they'd only seen her daughter, giving a description of her. But nobody had seen her. Somebody had heard a cry uh, on one of the streets near Morfield's late at night, as her son was shouting out. And that's all anybody might have, might have heard. And then, just under a month later, uh, Elizabeth Canning reappeared. Uh, she turned up in her mother's house at 10 o'clock at night on the 29th of January, 1753. And her mother fainted at the sight of her. She probably clearly thought she was gone forever. Um, and within minutes, the whole house was full of neighbours because it was very close knit to communities. This London was relatively small to what it is today. And people had all heard about the story, so they all rushed into the house. And this was described as being in a deplorable condition. Her face and hands were black uh, with dirt. She wore a shift petticoat and a bed gown, so she went the streets in her underclothes, basically. And a dirty rag tied around her head was soaked with blood from the wound on her ear. And then she told her story about what had happened to her. So she said that she'd been attacked by two men near Bedlam uh, Hospital. I'm just going to jump uh, back. Uh, there's Bedlam, Bedlam Hospital, is there. So, uh, a very large building, everyone would have known it. So she was attacked somewhere around here, or she claimed she was attacked somewhere around here. Uh, by two men in Bedlam Hospital. They had partially stripped her, robbed her, and hit her on the temple, wrenching her unconscious. And she says she awoke by a large road where there was water, uh, with the two men that robbed her was forced to walk to a house where an old woman asked if she would go their way, i.e. would she become a prostitute. 
Um, uh, Elizabeth Payne refused, and the woman cut off her corsets, cut off her stays, slapped her around the face, and pushed her upstairs into a loft. Why she cut off her stays, I'm not quite certain why, why she would have done that. So, this is, the later, this is later in the year, this picture was drawn. This is Elizabeth Canyon, looking not much like the portraits of her. <coughs> and this is the woman who is cutting, cut off her stays. There's her stays and there's the knife. And this is another woman. These two women are later involved. Um, and we'll come to this in a minute. So they push her upstairs into a loft. Um, and there, the young maid servant, by uh, Elizabeth, um, had remained for almost a month with no visitors, only existing on bread and water. She claims that in that loft, which is that bit of the house at the back, just there, is that upper part, she claimed that in that, in that room, where she was left just to rot, basically, she found a loaf of wheat and bread and a jug of water. And she claims that she lived, lived for nearly a month on just that bread and water. Um, the clothing that she wore had been uh, scavenged from the fireplace, so the clothing that she turned up in had been scavenged from the fireplace. And she eventually uh, escaped by pushing some boards away from the window and walking a five-hour journey home. It's that window there at the back in the box. Uh, she recalled, she says, hearing the name Wills or Wells. Uh, and as she'd seen through the window a coachman she recognised, she thought she'd been held on half the road. That's the A10 today. So she, she looked through a hole in the, in, the, in the wall and she thought she'd recognised the coach, probably the Hartford coach, going past. Um, but she escaped by um, pushing uh, some of the boards over the window out. She claimed she dropped down onto the, onto the ground and then made her escape. Um, not down the A10 or the Hartford Road, but by going down around back streets across the fields so nobody would uh, accost her. When she told this story, um, uh, the neighbours of John Winkleberry and a local journeyman called Robert Scarrett identified the house as that of Mother Susanna Wells, an Enfield wash nearly 10 miles distant. Basically, the implication is that Mother Wells' house was uh, a brothel. So these men obviously knew about this brothel, but they, they weren't too ashamed to admit that they could probably identify that. She didn't say it was the house of Mother Wells, and she didn't exactly say where it was. She just knew it was on, the, on the, uh, that particular road. So an arrest warrant was issued just a couple of days later, and uh, Elizabeth Cunningham's friends took her to Enfield Wash. They took her in a coach. But concerned about her because she was so well, some people thought she was going to die. She was in such a terrible state. Um, they wanted her to identify her captors and the room where she'd been uh, kept. They needed her to do that because in the 18th century, um, for anybody to uh, prosecute a crime, you had to prosecute the crime yourself if you were the victim. You, uh, you had to identify the people or catch them red-handed. There was no detective work going on. So they wanted her to go in there and identify these people and make sure that the room she described fitted to the description. Uh, so they met with the warrant officer and several police officers and they found uh, Mother Wells in her house. And um, so back is Mother Wells there, Susanna Wells. Uh, an old woman named Mary Squires, which is in fact this woman here. A young woman called Virtue Hall, who clearly wasn't that virtue. <laughs> and a woman they supposed was Wells' daughter. Another woman, Judith Nartus, was brought down from the loft to be questioned with the rest. So it's interesting that there was another woman <coughs> up in this loft where Elizabeth claimed she was. So as I say, this is a later, uh, later in the year's picture was drawn. These are the holes in the wall that Elizabeth looked through to see the coach. Uh, this is the fireplace, etc. So these two women are very significant in her story. This is a picture of the loft that she claimed she was kept in. Um, and she described it in some detail uh, in her evidence early on. But the warrant officer who searched the loft was surprised to discover it didn't resemble the room that she described. And not only to find evidence of having jumped from the window. And apparently the, the mud outside the window was quite wet and there was no evidence that she dropped into, uh, into the, uh, the grass and things growing outside. The rest of the party and the whole gang had gone up there with, with, with them. When they arrived, uh, they were also similarly surprised, surprised that the loft didn't fit Elizabeth Cunning's um, description. But this picture was drawn uh, shortly afterwards, um, showing the exact layout of the, the, the uh, inside of the lock. So this Canning arrived a little bit later uh, with her mother <coughs> and two other people, and they, she was carried into the house where she identified this woman, Mary Squires, not Mother Wells, whose house it was. 
and who they all said is Mother Wells's house, but this one, very quiet, uh, as the woman who'd cut off her stays. Um, and she claims that uh, a woman called, a virtue call and a woman, uh, who she presumed to be Squire's daughter, had been present at the time of her stays being cut off. So two witnesses, she says, were there. Kelly was taken upstairs and she identified the loft as the room in which she was imprisoned. So she said it was the loft, even though it didn't fit her description. Um, boards covering the window appeared to be uh, recently replaced, so that may be some evidence that she was right. Uh, Squires and Wells were arrested. Uh, the former uh, was arrested for removing Canning's stays, so uh, of course it, the latter for keeping disorderly house. So the, the second accusation was really unconnected with uh, this was Canning's kidnap and uh, being held hostage. This is a uh, picture of the house that we've seen before, so and that's the loft here behind. Uh, the layout of the house is drawn on this little plan. And the loft, which we've seen, is above these two buildings here, above the cellar in this building here. So the people who were accused were taken before a justice, uh, where Virtue Ball, who we probably mentioned her, uh, denied any knowledge of uh, that anything had taken place, and she was discharged. Uh, but Squires uh, was committed to the new prison for the robbery, and Wells <coughs> for aiding and abetting her. So the two older women were sent to, uh, to jail to await trial. Um, however, soon afterwards, Paul, Virtue Paul, was examined for six hours by Justice Fielding. This is Justice Fielding. This is Henry Fielding, the novelist, who was uh, deeply involved in uh, justice in the city of London. He interviewed her basically for six hours and said, look, if you don't come up with a best story of this, I'm going to send you to prison. And you can just wait there and do, see what happens to you. So uh, she then said she would tell the whole truth, and she said, um, that Canyon had been at Mrs. Wells' house and was robbed in the manner that she had herself said. So she claimed that Mrs. Canyon was telling the truth and that Virtue Paul had been a witness to what had gone on. So Mary Squires and Mother Wells were brought to trial in the Old Bailey. This is a picture of the Sessions House at the Old Bailey. And they were convicted, principally on the evidence of Virtue Paul. So they were convicted on the evidence of that witness but basically being harangued by Fielding for six hours until he said, I'm sending you to prison until you come up with a better story. And um, three witnesses had travelled up from Dorset and had sworn that Squires, Mary Squires, was actually in Dorset at the time of the robbery. Um, and in fact, lots and lots of people had turned up from Dorset um, to three witnesses in her defence, and they weren't allowed into the session south by the mob who were outside. The mob now, because it all got in the newspapers, the mob now regarded Canning as being a bit of a heroine, that she resisted being and becoming a prostitute and then nearly starved to death. So they didn't want anybody getting into that, that uh, session's house and defending these two, these two women. Uh, Mother Wells, who was the, the keeper of the house, was sent to be branded on the thumb in keeping the disorderly house, and the punishment was caught, uh, carried out forthwith amid the jeering and the exalted crowd. So this is, this is something that seems quite extraordinary to us today. If you were found guilty of a fairly minor crime, and keeping disorderly house was a relatively minor crime in that period, you would be burnt in the thumb from here, in the prison, immediate, in, the, in the courtroom, immediately after you were condemned. So that's what's going to this is actually a man made to make sure that he's essentially uh, being branded on the thumb. The reason you did it was one, it certainly hurt, so we were punishment. But also, if you were caught again, they knew, knew that you'd been found guilty of a crime of that sort of level and they would recognise you. There were no passports, no identification at that time, but they knew that you'd been tried before and they'd been marked, so you couldn't then receive such a, a lenient uh, punishment again. You would get some great punishment. So she was branded and she was, she was let go. Mary Squires, this is a picture of Mary Squires, um, she was a gypsy, according to everybody, you know, and uh, I'm going to use that word, because uh, that's the word they used in the 18th century. She was sentenced to be hanged for stealing a little Kelling stain. You were hanged at uh, that period for stealing something that was over a certain value, six shillings and eight pence. The uh, jury had the right to find you guilty of a, a small amount of money, uh, and therefore you wouldn't be hanged. But she was found guilty and she was condemned to be hanged, which seems extraordinary to us today, uh, that for stealing somebody's costume. 
uh, she was hanged for us for keeping a, a brothel, which was an evil day as it is today. Um, you would just get branded on them on the whole time. So let's just say something about Mary Squires. Um, she was always described as a gypsy, and she was always described as having a remarkable appearance. She probably suffered from a disease called scrofula, which made um, her lips and nose very swollen. She dressed, she's always been shown dressed like this. And you start to realise when you read the, the histories that there's some sort of prejudice going on. One, to her looks, and two, to the fact that she's a gypsy. Three, they start to conflate her image with that of witches and witchcraft. And so if you contrast her image with that of Elizabeth Kelly, you start to see that people are contrasting these two people, an innocent maid and possibly a foreign uh, gypsy woman. But this man, Sir Chris Gascoigne, who was Lord Mayor, was sitting in the court. He had the right to sit in the court as a sort of observer. And he wasn't satisfied with the verdict. And so um, he knew that uh, Squires had this alibi. So people said that she'd been in Dorset. And he also knew that one of the witnesses uh, was a clergyman. So he wasn't happy with what had gone on at all. He did a lot of investigation and interviewing people, which we can't go into that sort of detail now. But what he did was he went to the king, and the king granted a stay of execution, and eventually gave a free pardon to the gypsy. So Elizabeth Kelly was now accused of perjury. So because it, it's it's sort of slightly odd now that if you if somebody's found guilty and then somebody's found innocent, then the person who accused you must have must have committed perjury, which is not necessarily the case nowadays. Um, the mob basically who were really wound up by everything that was going on uh, didn't like this at all. And uh, they accused Chris Gascoigne of being king of the gypsies. And he was quite often attacked when he went through the street, and his coach was attacked, and all those were smashed. And they started to produce um, satirical images like this. So this is the contest. It's Elizabeth Kelly, Mary Squires. Um, and the city split in two. Some people started supporting one, some people started supporting the other. This bottle down here, I think, is a reference to a scam where a man claimed that he would go up here on stage and he would get inside a bottle. And people paid a lot of money to go to the theatre and watch this. And he never turned up to get inside the bottle. And the bottle was he never turned up and the money. So what this is actually showing is that basically, this whole thing is a bit of an illusion, you know. Is there something going on here or isn't there something going on here? Are we being conned? And things started to appear in print shops um, that were mocking uh, both uh, <coughs> squires and uh, Gascoigne and the people who were supporting her case. So as you can see, the images get more like witches rather than, than, than gypsies. As we get to this, so because people, some people said that they would seen uh, Mary Squires in Enfield around the right time, and other people said she was in Dorset, then they started to say, how could she be in two places at once? She must be a witch. And she flew between the two places. <laughs> The whole city, as I said, split in two, and they fell into two camps. There were the Canaanites, or the Canaanites, they sometimes called, because the other half were called the Egyptians, because they supported the, the gypsy. And they started producing prints like this. So you can see that the immediate contrast between uh, the two peoples. So more um, satirical cartoons were produced. The whole story started getting wound up with the bill that was going to Parliament, which was going to give some. Uh, um, more liberal attitudes to the Jewish population in this country. So they then started to associate the gypsies with the Jews, and lots of prejudice starts coming into the whole, the whole business. Um, in 17, uh, September 1753, the three witnesses who actually managed to get into the, into the court case eventually were they themselves accused of perjury uh, and they were tried. But a hundred people came up from Dorset to say that their story was right. And they were basically um, found not guilty and they were released. So then there was a, the whole city was out in turmoil. No one knew what had actually gone on. People were divided, people were attacking each other in, uh, in the newspapers, literally attacking each other in the streets, and they were taking sides. So eventually, Elizabeth Cannon, uh, who had been basically keeping a very low profile at this time, was charged with perjury and sentenced for a trial in the Sessions. 
So at this time, lots and lots of pamphlets have been produced, and that's what we've got at Gilshaw Library. We've got uh, an incredible collection of material relating to the Kenyon case. These are three of the items, and they're actually, uh, <coughs> uh, we, well, I've got to put them over there, but I can get them out at the end. Um, so it shows you that some people took one side, some people took the other side. Um, some people seem to be unconnected with the novels like that, they are just Alan Ramsey produced a pamphlet on it. Voltaire picked up a story in France. There's another one that supports Mary Squires. The special magazines were produced, so the, the whole the whole system was really enjoying the whole, the whole business, basically. Elizabeth Canning was brought to trial on the 29th of April 1754, so this is more than a year after the events had taken place. When it's its prosecution claims that Squire has been endorsed at the time we did that, whilst the defence produced witnesses claims she'd been seen in Enfield as early as Christmas, so before kidnapping. Uh, the testimony that the defence witnesses was pulled apart because they couldn't remember the exact dates. And that was probably because of the fact that the previous year the calendar had changed. So you know, we moved from the, from the uh, junior to the Gregorian calendar. Um, so we'd lost 11 days. Uh, towards the end of the previous year. And people have got very confused about what day Christmas actually was, etc., and what day was the first of January. Um, so uh, the, the whole witnesses basically couldn't uh, confirm exactly what they got on. Um, this is a very unusual picture because we very rarely see any pictures of the inside of, of the session house, and this shows her at the bar being tried. And this is a drawing that was done actually in the session house of Elizabeth. So again, very, very unusual to have a drawing of an ordinary person in the 18th century. Um, they took two hours, the jury, to find her guilty of perjury, but not willful and corrupt perjury. Um, but the recall went back to the judge. He wasn't happy with this because that's the partial verdict. Like he, wanted, he wanted them to find her guilty of what she'd been charged of, not of a lesser crime. Um, so they took another 10, uh, 20 minutes to find her guilty of willful and corrupt perjury. So she was held in Newgate Prison and was sentenced on the 30th of May to a month's imprisonment. I'm not quite sure why just a month. Followed by seven years' transportation. But it may be something behind that that the government basically want to put an end to this whole business because uh, the whole city were completely obsessed with it. There were troubles going to go on. Let's just try to get her out of the country. Um, according to state trials, which is uh, one of the uh, important records of the trials, uh, Canning actually is recorded to say something. There's no other uh, record of her saying anything in the trial. Um, in state trials, if you go to the old Bailey Sessions papers, you can see a complete transcript of the, uh, the trial. Uh, she said she hopes they will be faithful to her, uh, that she had no intent of swearing the gypsy's life away, and that what had been done was only defending herself, and that she desired to be considered unfortunate. So she wants to be, uh, to be sympathetic to her. Um, despite calls for clemency, she was taken to the convict ship, uh, Mertilla, in August 1754, which set sail from Deal, heading to Philadelphia eventually. Um, she arrived in Wethersfield, Connecticut, uh, by arrangement with her supporters, who were also supplied with money. Uh, she went to live with a Methodist minister called uh, uh, Elisha Williams. So, what we do know is she probably had about £100 she was sent away with. Um, that's uh, because people have raised uh, money, there'd been uh, an appeal to raise money for them. And when you're transported normally, when you get transported for a crime, then you would normally basically be sold into slavery for seven years in the Americas. You'd be sold to some, uh, some person who would employ you without giving you any pay, and then you would become free. She never seems to have gone through this because she would have had some faithful backers. So she went to live with this uh, Methodist minister. Um, the Reverend Williams died just about a year after her arrival. And she married a man called John Treat, a distant relation of the former governor. So she's gone up in the world uh, in the uh, former Maori. Uh, and on the 20th of November 1756, and then she had a son, Joseph Kelly Treat, and then a daughter, Elizabeth, and then two more sons, one from John, one from Salmon. And she checked that, but there was a problem with her, an error. But Salmon wasn't the only one who talked. She appears never to have said another word about what happened. She did appear in uh, the American sort of papers because she had a dream one night and she dreamt that she uh, could see the future and that uh, she would be involved in some dramatic drama. This was under 
related to her, uh, her trial, but she got into the legal business. And then the Connecticut Current published the following announcement in 1773. Half of the June 22, last week, died very suddenly at Wethersfield. Mrs. Elizabeth Treat, wife of Mr. Treat, formerly the famous Elizabeth Kane. So that was the end, end of her story. Um, and nobody knows what the actual truth was. There are lots and lots of books written about, about this kind of story. This is the one I first read many years ago, and I would recommend this one. Um, it's, it's not necessarily fully accurate, but it's a really, really good read for Kelly and Nicola. You can also pick it up um, second hand, it's not quite cheap. Um, but her story was revived by Josephine Kay. Josephine Tay, a very famous novelist, um, was writing in the uh, 1940s and 1950s, and she wrote something called The Franchise Affair. And the Franchise Affair is a modelization of the uh, Canyon story. And it made into a film, and the film was made in the 1950s. I've seen the film. It, you, can see, you can see the plot um, that they take him. They modelized it, she's modelized it up, into, into a small uh, Sussex town. When the man on the left uh, is a solicitor who's asked by the woman on the right to investigate the accusation that she kidnapped uh, someone called Betty Kane. And if you want to know, I won't tell you what the what uh, Josephine Tay comes to the conclusion about what happened, but if you read it, she comes to a uh, conclusion that I used to agree with, but now I, I disagree with. So it's worth reading, it's a good, it's a good read. Um, lots of people come up with lots of different ideas about what happened to her. Some people say she went up with a boy. Ravished and beaten up and came back. And some people say she went away and had a child, covered it up, came, came back. Some people say she was probably kidnapped, possibly by those people that were abused, but not by the gypsy, that she had blows to the head and was very confused about what actually happened to her. Um, as I said, her picture was drawn, was painted by a number of artists, and this is the one that I find very intriguing. She's a bit like a Mona Lisa. You cannot really read anything from her face. I think her face really warmed you. So I just need you to make up your mind about what the story might be. Uh, I'd like to invite you into Guildford Library. We have lots of modern books on the good family you can have a look at. See if you can find out what the answer is. See if you agree with some of the theories uh, they have. I don't know what the answer, what the answer might be. I'm, I'm most, probably most on the side that it might be all did happen. That she possibly identified the wrong people, and that she once once all the crowds had taken to that house, she was a very uneducated um, uh, person. She was only 18, so you can imagine the pressure of people pushing her to say, "Is this the person?" So who knows what happened? But that is the story. Of